group. We were just talking about both of us college teachers or a retired college teacher and, and, and always like to get started right on time and go all the way to the very end of class and students wanted to get out of class early and I said, well, you paid for the whole thing. I, I don't like depriving you of what you paid for. That was not their attitude, however. <laughs> Anyway, so welcome to Tuesdays with our uh, January lecture. I'm Bob Willey, and I think I know most, if not all of you, and uh, have had the privilege over the last oh, five years or so to be uh, president of the Friends of the Georgetown Library. And it is a privilege because this is such a fantastic library with an incredible staff. I'd say it even if two staff members weren't here, or three staff members were not here. Uh, but it really is a, a great library doing a wonderful job of serving the Georgetown community as well as Georgetown County through its other branches. Um, I guess we'll start also by saying Happy New Year. Uh, this is our first event of the new year, first formal event of the new year, and actually have not been together with the Tuesdays with since back in November. Uh, we had a great fall uh, with three wonderful lectures in the fall and now begin our very busy January through May series of lectures uh, in our Tuesdays with series. We had in between, and I do want to mention this, our annual Yuletide home tour, which was an incredible success. Um, we had over 300 people participate, which is almost three times uh, more than we've ever had involved in our activities. I think people are just anxious to get out and to do things, but it also was a wonderful opportunity to be able to see the historic homes uh, here in Georgetown, the city of Georgetown. And it provided for us considerable funds uh, and our purpose as the Friends of the Library is to raise money for the children's programs here, children's and youth programs here at the Georgetown Library. So it was a great success in that way as well. Anyway, Tuesdays With has been a series as we've had now for five years. Uh, it's based on a book that came out, a best-selling book that came out in 1997, Tuesdays With Maury. And that book describes what is a relationship between a professor, a college professor, and a student that continued far beyond the four years of college. And that's what our series is all about, continue learning opportunities to be able as adults to continue to learn, which we really do need to do, and uh, to have uh, an expansion of subjects with which we're already familiar, which is the case for some of you I know today, but also learning more about those subjects and expanding our knowledge as we continue in our adult years. We're very privileged today uh, to have with us Dr. Jeanette Myers. And uh, we always begin with uh, her credentials or the speaker's credentials. Bachelor's degree from Mankato. Mankato State University, where she did her bachelor's degree. Master's degree from Clemson. And also her doctorate at Clemson in astrophysics. She became a professor at Francis Marion University in 2003, where she is now a professor of astronomy coordinator of the astronomy program and director of the Dooley Planetarium, about which she's going to speak today. And I'll give, uh, those are very impressive, but what's really neat is her greatest credential is she speaks to the children here at the Georgetown Library and is very, very successful. In fact, Sheila was here earlier making arrangements or preliminary arrangements for her next speaking engagement with us. Uh, so we're looking forward to having her. Yes? Can we attend those all? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, that's, that's a good point. I'll, I'll actually reinforce that. There's a children's program coming up in February to which we're all invited. So I'll let you know more about that as we get to the end of our program today. Anyway, will you join me in welcoming Dr. Jeanette Myers? All right, well, good morning. So we're gonna make it a little bit darker in here just so that my slides kind of pop and makes it a little easier to see. So, um, yeah, we're going to talk about the winter skies and especially about what's happening here in January. And so on the back table were sky maps and some other handouts. So feel free to take as many of those as you'd like. Um, all good professors have an outline. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about me and who I am. And then we're going to talk a little bit about understanding star patterns and how we can start to pick things out in the nighttime sky. We'll talk specifically about the January constellations, and then we'll look ahead to spring and some of the upcoming events and things that you can look forward to. So uh, just to kick it off a little bit about me. So I grew up in the state of Minnesota, and like many of you, I don't like winter. And so I tried my hardest to get away from Minnesota as quickly as I could. So I went to 
Uh, Mankato State University in Minnesota, now it is known as Minnesota State University at Mankato. They did a name change a few years ago. But I earned my Bachelor's of Science in both Physics and Astronomy. And for the first three years of my career at Mankato, the two departments were completely separated. And so I was working two different degree programs. And then my senior year, the two departments merged into one. And so I ended up with a composite degree called Physics and Astronomy. Then I went on to Clemson University, where I earned my master's in physics and my PhD in astrophysics. And so I started searching for jobs, and I applied all over the country and even up to Vermont. And then I was like, no, I don't want to go to Vermont. And then this position in Francis Marion opened up, and I thought, this is great. It keeps me down south, which is what I wanted. And it also had an observatory. It had a planetarium. I could teach astronomy classes, and I thought, this is great. And so I took that job. And I started in uh, August of 2003 with the big Mars opposition event. And I had 1,000 people come out to see Mars through a telescope. And so I've been doing very large events <laughs> for quite a few years. But my biggest claim to fame is this little guy over here. This is Stanford Observatory located on the Mankato State University ca uh, campus. And there was a little 11-inch uh, telescope in that little dome there, but the little house there contained multiple little telescopes that we'd pull out and set up. And it was April 9, 1993, where I got to touch a telescope for the very first time. And I pointed that telescope, and I found the object M42. So this is when I, I'd already wanted to be an astronomer, but up until 1993, I had never touched a telescope. And so this was sort of cemented my love of astronomy. But I've had that love of astronomy since I was in the fifth grade. And I am getting very old now. I'm, I'm close to 50. I'm not there yet, but I am almost at 50. So I have been doing astronomy for a very long time, 26 years of doing planetarium shows, and I'm in my 19th year of teaching. So, uh, but that's just a little bit about me. And so let's, uh, let's jump into uh, understanding those star patterns. So all good astronomers use star atlases. And if you're just a beginner astronomer, you can use uh, something a little bit easier. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. So uh, Sky and Telescope, are, the magazine, actually put out their own star atlas. And so this is what it looks like. It's called the Pocket Star Atlas. This is the jumbo edition. So they do have a smaller edition. But it has pages inside that show you all the different star patterns. And so these are really nice. And so some star patterns are a little bit more complex than others. But what you get is your, your constellation. And usually they, they draw it with lines. So you can kind of see what the figure of that constellation is. And so you can easily pick out all the different ones. But an atlas like this one is important for people who really want to get into astronomy because you can use it throughout the entire year. You can use it at the different times of night, but also any day of the year. And that's very important. So we want to be able to refer to things, and our sky is constantly changing. And so we want to be able to see new things that are appearing in our sky and figure out where they actually are. So this one is not too bad. They have a much smaller edition as well, but both of them work very well. But if you're just getting started into astronomy and you want to get sort of an overview of what to expect for an entire month, then I highly recommend these sky maps. And the best part about these sky maps is they are free. And I love things that are free. So you can actually go to their website. It's called skymaps.com. And they have a link to a PDF file. And the PDF file is just this, you know, when you print it out, you get this little sheet of paper. So this is what I gave everyone as you were coming in and sitting down. And so these are very nice because it gives you a nice calendar of what's going to be happening throughout the entire month. And these always come out on the first of every month. So February 1st, we'll have a brand new calendar. And so you can see uh, today is the 18th. And so the moon was near the beehive cluster M44 today. And so uh, if you were looking at the nighttime sky, you'd be able to find the moon and know that it was near the beehive cluster. And so you get this big window that shows you the sky. But the unfortunate thing about a sky map like this is it is set to a very specific time. And so this one is set for kind of a nice observing time, 
roughly around uh, 7.30 would be a good time to use this sky map right now. And as we go to the end of the month, then it would be at 7 o'clock. And so this is our first big lesson about the nighttime sky. So when you see the stars in the sky tonight, and you look at that pattern of stars, well, the Earth is turning, and the Earth is orbiting around the sun. And it turns out that the time it takes for Earth to complete one rotation on its axis is actually not 24 hours, but a little less than 24 hours. So that means that tomorrow, all those stars that we see in the sky, they're going to come up even earlier. And so the patterns start to shift in the sky. And that's important because we don't see the exact same star pattern every single month. They shift over time. Now, Earth is going around the sun, and we get to see different star patterns at night. So we need to have a new map every month to show us how this shifting is occurring. And so what we find is that constellations, as they leave our sky, they drift over to the west, and they disappear. And then new things start coming up in the east. So on our east side of our map, we're starting to see the constellation of Cancer moving up into the sky, and leaving over in the west is constellations like Aquarius. And so we won't be seeing Aquarius as we go into February. It's going to leave our sky. So when you're trying to find a constellation in the sky, you have to kind of also know what is the best time of the year to actually see it. And so right now, we have some very prominent constellations that we'll take a look at. Now, one of the nice things about uh, maps, whether you're using a paper form or whether you're using a big atlas book like this, is they have a very common key. And that's very important because we want people to be able to enjoy the nighttime sky and learn about the nighttime sky. So we use the same symbols on our different maps so that people know, OK, if I see this symbol that has a circle with a cross through it, it means this type of object. And so that's very important also to make it a little bit easier to get more familiar with the nighttime sky. So there's a key that's located down over here in the lower corner of your map. Now, the back side of the map is also just as important as the front side of the map because it actually breaks down in categories things that you can see with your eyes, things that you can see if all you have is a pair of binoculars, and then things that you can find if you have a telescope. Now, the Georgetown Library actually does have telescopes that people can check out and take home with them. They're small telescopes, but you can still see things in the nighttime sky, and they're not very hard to set up. And so I've done telescope workshops out here showing people how to actually use those telescopes. But if you're a bird watcher and you have a pair of binoculars, you can use binoculars to look at a lot of these things in the nighttime sky that I'm going to highlight today. Many of these were very easy to find objects, and they belong to a list known as the Messier list. And so um, binoculars like this, this is actually a very fancy pair of binoculars. It has a button on it called a stabilizer button. So if your hands are shaking a lot, it can help to stabilize the image when you look at it. And so um, this can be mounted on a little tripod if you needed to. So these are my little fancier binoculars. All right. Let me put those down over there. Okay. There we go. Yep. Wrong way there. Try that again. I think your battery is not working or something's not working. That went back. There we go. There we go. All right. Now, the other important part about the star atlases is the key for the stars themselves. And so you'll find these little dots on the star atlas to represent the different stars. And you'll notice that they don't have the same size. Some are much, much bigger than others. And this tells you about the brightness of the stars. So in order to get across that stars have different brightnesses, they use the different size circles. So this actually um, dates all the way back to the very ancient star maps. And so there was a scale that was developed. And it basically comes apart from, or came apart from this idea here, where you look at the nighttime sky, and the first stars that appear in the sky to your eyes, you give them the number one. And then the next stars that appear to your eye, you give them the number two. And then the third star, you give them a number three. So as you count one, two, three, four, five to six, 
you're seeing fainter and fainter stars. So the brighter stars are the lower numbers, and the higher numbers, like six, are very faint, so hard to see with your eye. So six is referred to as the naked eye limit. So if you decide to, say, uh, name a star after someone, and you're given the information about that star, you have to look at the magnitude value of that star that you were given that you named, because if the magnitude value is a number that's bigger than six, you can't see it with your eyes. You have to use a telescope. And so they sort of rearranged the numbers a few years ago to uh, expand it and make it a little bit better. And so now we have negative magnitudes for some of the stars. And so that's why we can have some very large circles for a few of the stars on our star maps. Okay. So now, not everybody can see to a magnitude 6. I can't see to a magnitude 6. I see to about 5.6. Okay. So if you have that really good vision, if you're still around 2020, you might see 6. And some people can see just a little bit beyond 6. But that's sort of the cutoff. Right there. So most star atlases like this are going to be drawn to that limit of six, but a pocket atlas will be drawn to a, a deeper limit. And so that will help you with your, when you're using your telescope. So you have to do be careful about that, that the magnitude scale, it is backwards, so it gets a little used to kind of getting that around your head that a very large number means very faint. Okay. So also in understanding the star patterns, we have to understand that there's a difference between what astronomers call a constellation and what astronomers refer to as the constellation figure. So a constellation is basically just a region of the nighttime sky. It's like a giant jigsaw puzzle piece. And they have very, very odd shapes. And so in this picture here, we're highlighting the constellation of Orion. And so you can see Orion's boundary box has these little tiny edges, and it's not a nice uniform box all around. And a little tiny bump out right here. There's a little bump right here. And so they're not all nice uniform pieces. And there are some that have curves instead of straight lines. So that is the constellation boundary box. And then inside of it is the figure. The figure that we draw is supposed to be the easiest pattern of stars that you can pick out. But you'll see that even in Orion, there are a lot of tiny little stars in this constellation. So there are a lot of very faint stars there that once you start using a telescope or a pair of binoculars, some of the, you start to see all these really faint stars. But our primary ones is what's going to make up our figure. That's what we're most interested in. Now, there are 88 constellations in the entire sky, but there are 13 that we actually cannot see. Just because of where we live on planet Earth, we're at a latitude of around 34 degrees north of the equator, and so there's a whole region around the south celestial pole we just can't see. Those stars are never above our horizon. And so that makes up about 13 constellations down there that we just never get to see. So things like crux, if you've ever heard of the Southern Cross, we don't get to see that. Okay. So I like to show off this little guy here. And I'll put him up here so you can see what he looks like. So this is called the celestial sphere. And this is how people thought about the nighttime sky for literally thousands of years. So this came about from the ancient Greeks. They envisioned the entire sky as this giant sphere around planet Earth. And then they started to realize that the star patterns, they didn't rearrange themselves from night to night, month to month, or year to year. And so they started to make those patterns in the nighttime sky, those easy to pick out things. And it turns out it wasn't just the Greeks that were doing it, it was also the Chinese. It was the different countries in Africa that were coming up with their own patterns. Native Americans came up with their own patterns. And so over the years though, we started trade and people started sharing stories. And so we had to come up with a common set of patterns. And so in the 1900s, early part of the 1900s, they basically had a meeting of international astronomers and they decided to uh, have 88 common patterns. And so those are the 88 that we use today. But there were, in the past, a lot more constellations in different constellations, depending upon the culture that you grew up in.
Now, the other thing that shows up when you're learning about the constellation is this word called asterism. So an asterism is an easy to pick out pattern in the nighttime sky. Now, an asterism could be inside a big constellation boundary box, or it might use stars of boundary boxes that are very close together. And so one of the most common asterisms, one that most people know, is the Big Dipper. That is an asterism. But the actual constellation is Ursa Major, the Greater Bear. And so the Greater Bear is a very, very large region of the nighttime sky. The Greater Bear is uh, among the top three largest constellations. But most people only think about the Big Dipper, which is this pattern right here of seven very bright stars. And so they ignore all the rest of the bear. So there are a lot of asterisms. One of the more prominent ones that we talk about in the fall skies or even the summer skies is the summer triangle. And that's three very bright stars from three different constellations that just happen to be close together. And so they make up a giant triangle that you can see in your summer to fall skies. So there are also some asterism patterns that we'll kind of point out today as well. Okay, so let's start our tour through our constellations of the sky and let's start with Orion because Orion is the largest uh, or brightest of the constellations. He's really prominent in our sky. And so right now, when you go outside at night at around 7.30 and you're gonna wanna look to the southeast. And so when you look to the southeast, you're going to find Orion right there in the sky. Now, he's really easy to pick out because he looks like a giant rectangle with the three stars that make a little line right here. Who knows? What do we call those three stars? The belt. The belt. That is an asterism. So Orion's belt is an asterism in the nighttime sky. It's part of the Orion constellation, but not the entire constellation. So... We have Orion's belt right there, very easy to pick out. And then we have Betelgeuse in the shoulder, and we have Rigel down in the foot. And we imagine that he's holding a, a sword up above his head, and then he's trying to hold a shield out in front of him. The shield is really, really hard to see. It's a bunch of really faint stars. And so you can see here with the lines drawn that there's his shield right there. So it's, it's not very bright. And so sometimes you can pick it out in the nighttime sky, and other times it might be a little bit more difficult. Now, because Orion is our hunter and he's very bright, uh, one of the things that we notice is that there are also a lot of very bright stars around Orion. And so Orion is sort of uh, surrounded by uh, there are like eight really bright stars in this region of the sky. And so these eight stars are really cool. Now, when you look at the nighttime sky, it's also very important to realize that not all stars are the same. Some stars are very small. Other stars are really, really big. And so I want to take a moment just to refer to some of these bright stars. And so I like to use this diagram here. It's a nice little scale up diagram. And so we start with image number one, where we have our planets. This is Mercury, Mars, Venus, and Earth. So those are what we call the rocky planets. We take Earth and we put Earth down here, and we compare Earth to our gas giants. So we have Neptune, Uranus, what's this one? Saturn, and then Jupiter. Jupiter we'll see in a little bit. So these are our gas giants, these are our terrestrial planets, and we take Jupiter, and Jupiter is now all the way down here. There he is. Planets are very small compared to stars. So. This is actually a star right here that is in Leo the Lion. This is known as Wolf 359. So not all stars have really nice names. Sometimes they're just uh, an astronomer name and a number, how they were cataloged. So this is a star. It's a very small star, but there's our sun. And then this star right here is Sirius. And Sirius is known as the dog star, and it is the brightest star of the nighttime sky when the sun is not in the sky. And we're going to actually see Sirius in our sky tonight. Now, these are what we call dwarfs. They are all burning hydrogen in their centers. They're very 
Uh, very common stars, they're just like our sun, so they can get a little bit bigger and a little bit smaller. Then as stars change, and we take Sirius here, and we put Sirius right down here, stars expand and get larger as they get older. And so these stars are known as giants. And so here we have Pollux, Arcturus, and Aldebaran. So these stars are getting bigger and bigger in size. But they won't stop there. They'll get even bigger. They do a second expansion. And unfortunately, you can't see the word. Let's move this flower pot down for just a moment. So these here are supergiants. So we've taken Aldebaran over here, and we put Aldebaran right down here. He's very tiny. So supergiants get even larger in size. And so we have Rigel, which is actually the foot of Orion. We have Antares, which we see in our summer skies. He's part of the scorpion. Then we have Betelgeuse, which is the shoulder of Orion. And then uh, if we take Betelgeuse, and we put Betelgeuse right there, there are stars even bigger than Betelgeuse out there. They are known as hypergiants. And these are the biggest stars. Once the star gets to this size, more than likely they are either going to blow up or they're blowing off their outer layers, depending upon how they're going to end their lives. So stars come in all sorts of different sizes. So in our nighttime sky, we're going to see Sirius, we're going to see Pollux, Aldebaran, Rigel, and Betelgeuse. So when you see these stars in the nighttime sky, and you look at them in the nighttime sky, just know that some stars are super big, other stars are very small. And so Sirius is very small compared to that star Betelgeuse. Betelgeuse is a super giant out there. And so if I back up just for a moment, you can kind of see where some of these stars are. So here is Sirius, there's Rigel and Betelgeuse. This is Aldebaran. And then we also have some other very bright stars. We have Capella up here, Castor and Pollux, and Procyon right there. So all these stars that you see here, they're just all various different sizes. And they're all at different distances. They're not all the same distance from us either. Now, in Orion, though, there is a very, very cool nebula that you can take a look at. And what you do is you look for that belt, those three bright stars, and then hanging down from the belt is what we call the dagger. And the jewel of the dagger is what is known as the Orion Nebula. So this is known as Messier object number 45. And so on a star atlas or a star map, you'll see it as big capital M and then the number 45. So M45. So it is a very, very large cloud of gas and dust, and it's about 1,500 light years away from us. So a light year is the distance light travels in one year's time. It's about 6 trillion miles. So you take 6 trillion times 1,500, and that's how far away this object is. It's not close. But it is huge. It's 25 light years across. So Sometimes when you're out, and if you're in a very, very dark sky area, so if you decide to take a trip out to Arizona or Nevada and going out into the desert area where it gets really dark away from city lights and you see Orion, you can sometimes see a little fuzzy white patch in that jewel of the dagger that's hanging down from his belt. And then if you were to do really good photography, you can make all the colors come out. So this is a very good image. It was um, multiple images using different filters to bring out all those beautiful colors. But this is a large nebula, large cloud of gas and dust. It's a star forming region. And I know it's a little bit washed out in the very center, but if you look at this object through your telescope, you are not going to see these beautiful colors. Your eyes are very bad cameras. And so you can't resolve those colors just looking at it with your eyes. But you will see large and gray. But in the very center of it, and you can't see it very well here, but you will find four tiny little stars. And it's known as the trapezium. So it makes sort of a trapezoid shape. And those are baby stars. They're brand new. They're much, much younger than the sun. But they're very easy to pick out. And then when you look at the cloud, you'll be able to see this cloud, but you'll see it all in gray tones. So it won't have the beautiful colors. But to me, every time I see this picture like this, 
I always imagine a giant chicken. It's just what I see when I look at it. And so I see the little head and the little beak and then the big fluffy body. Okay. So many of the constellations or the deep sky objects, they get their names by what we associate them with and what the first images look like. But this one has always just been called the Orion Nebula. Now, uh, very close to the feet of Orion is our very, very bright star Sirius. And you can see that's a giant, giant circle. So that means it is a very bright star. Its magnitudes is actually in the negative numbers. And so here is Sirius. And right up here, you can see the feet of Orion. And right here is the Orion Nebula. So we're not too far away. If you take the belt, the belt kind of points down to Sirius. So it's a nice, easy way to find it. But if you have a pair of binoculars and you're looking around in the nighttime sky, this is Sirius here. This is Burzim, and Burzim is known as Beta over here. And then you'll find there's this little tiny grouping of stars down here, and it's known as Messier 41. And so on the star atlas, it's this big yellow circle right here with little dots around it. And so this is what is known as an open cluster. And so if I zoom in on it a little bit, so an open cluster, when you look at it, you can see space between the stars. And an open cluster can have upwards of 1,000 stars, but most of them have a lot fewer than that. And so this is a very beautiful open cluster, but it's down very low. So when you're outside looking around your house and you look to your south region, if you have really tall trees, you might have a hard time seeing this object. You might have to find some place where the tree line is very low or non-existent. So this is a, a very fun object to find in the nighttime sky. And the neat thing is if you are somebody that likes uh, geometry and you look for shapes like triangles and rectangles, this is sort of a uh, big triangle right here or a right angle triangle right here. And so you can make that shape in your mind and find that object. But this one has appeared in the nighttime sky as a little fuzzy patch. It was one of the first ways that it was found. And so if you're in a very good dark sky area, you can actually see that little grouping sort of appear as sort of a little fuzzy patch. because There's so much light coming from the stars right there. Okay. Now, a little bit higher in the sky, here is Orion. These sort of are mentioned. So this is going to be a little bit more towards the eastern part of your sky. But we have here Gemini the Twins. And so uh, Gemini is Pollux is one side, and Castor is the other. And uh, Castor's got a very long foot right here. But we have our two twins standing side by side. And then just off of the foot of Castor is what is known as M35. So it is another one of those open clusters. And so you can see there's that little grouping of stars, and there's a whole bunch of stars right there in the nighttime sky. So open clusters are uh, some of the easiest to find. You can also find uh, things like planetary nebulae, which are little clouds as well. And then uh, a very famous pattern in the sky is Taurus the bull. Uh, Taurus is right up here off the shield of Orion. So here's our shoulders, there's our shield. And then we have this strange letter V in the nighttime sky. And so this is the head of Taurus the bull. And I always love this particular pattern when you see it drawn, because you really have to use your imaginations. So you have green line here, green line here. So there's the V. And then you have this line out here. And then you have this going on. So this is supposed to be the body of the bull right here. So use your imaginations. Do you see a bull? <laughs> it sort of looks like the letter Y taking a bow. <laughs> So you really do have to use your imaginations uh, with these different constellations. And part of the reason why this doesn't show up as a body is that they imagine this is a bull coming out of a river. And so you're only seeing the head being exposed. So you have the long horns coming out. Now, this blue line has been passing through some of these patterns. And this blue line is called the ecliptic. And this is actually the pathway of the sun. 
And so the constellations that this blue line passed through make up what we call the zodiac. So when people talk about birth signs, this is where they're getting those constellations from. So Gemini the twins, uh, Taurus the bull, they are birth sign constellations. So on the day of, their, of someone's birth, if the sun was in Taurus, that would be their birth sign constellation. But because these are showing up in the nighttime sky right now, anybody born in January is not going to have Taurus as a birth sign because the sun is not in that constellation. Now, the Pleiades are very, very easy to spot in the nighttime sky. It's that little tiny grouping there. It's known as the Seven Sisters, and that's for the seven stars that you can see with your eyes. And so the Pleiades is actually a good eye test. So if you could see all seven stars, you have very good vision. But if you could only see five or six, your vision was a little poor. If you could only see two or three, you had very poor vision. And so they could use that as sort of a medieval eye test. That's how many of the Pleiades stars could you see? So Orion is our hunter with his shield. Taurus is a bull with his horns coming out. So we kind of imagine that these two are fighting each other, and that's why Orion has his shield up in front of him. Now, also in this constellation is a very interesting object. This is found right up here on the end of the horn. This is known as Messier number one. So this is the first object put in Messier's list. And this is the Crab Nebula. So this here is a very large cloud of gas and dust. It has a very strange appearance to it because this is not a normal nebula. This is actually the guts of a star. So on July 4th of 1054, Chinese astronomers cataloged a new star. They called it the visiting star. It was a star that exploded and suddenly got really, really bright in the sky. And so it appeared right over here. But then after a few weeks, it faded away, and they couldn't see it anymore with their eyes. So it was recorded as appearing over here, but then people had sort of left it off. And so we go from 1054 until around the 1700s, when Charles Messier, who was a comet hunter, was looking at the nighttime sky, and he came across it. And as he was looking at the shape, he realized, well, it's not a comet. And so he made a note about it. And then he started finding other fuzzy things that weren't comets, and he was getting very annoyed. And so what he did was he said, I'm going to make a list of all these fuzzy things that are not comets so I can just ignore them in the future. And that's how the Messier list started. And so the very first object that he put on this list was M1, the Crab Nebula. And the first sketches of this nebula made it look like a crab. And so if you use your imagination now, though, does it look like a crab? Not really. Uh, sometimes it kind of looks like a bat to me, but uh, no. Yeah, it could be a jellyfish. But again, remember, th this is a process color photograph. So when you see it in the nighttime sky through a telescope or a good pair of binoculars, it's a gray extended cloud. But that is the guts of a star. Now, just up above Orion, so Orion's uh, Sword is coming up this way. Here's Gemini and here's Taurus. So going up a little higher into the sky is this weird misshapen circle wearing a hat. And this is Auriga, the charioteer. So this is supposed to be a chariot driver. And the interesting thing about the chariot driver is that he is holding, in most pictures, a goat. And that is for this star here known as Capella. And so Capella in... Uh, Old Arabic is known as little she-goat, and so that is where the goat in the pictures come about from. So in this one, we find, again, find some beautiful little open clusters. They're right here, so very easy to pick out. So we have, uh, this is 37, 36, 38, but there's 36, 37, 38. And so they all look a little bit different from each other. But again, they have those space between the stars, these little tiny groupings that you can see. Now, I should point out, that when you see Capella right here, this is not a single star. There are actually four stars there, and they're in pairs. And these pairs are actually orbiting around each other. So these are uh, four stars, the two in pairs that are going around and around there. So they're known as binary star systems. And Castor, 
which is the star right here, isn't one single star. That is actually six stars. And there are three binary star systems in Castor. All of the stars are going around and around each other. So uh, many stars are single stars, like our sun, but there are many stars out there that are binary stars, where there is two stars going around and around each other. And when you use a telescope, you start to see those stars. Now, if we shift over to the western side of the sky, what we're going to see is a, a big story that comes from ancient Greeks. And uh, you may have heard it before. It's the story of Andromeda and Perseus. You may have seen the movie Clash of the Titans, especially the one from the 1980s with Harry Hamlin, as it was well known for the stop motion uh, features in it. So this story is here in the nighttime sky, and it has all the major players there. And so for the ancient Greeks, to become a constellation of the nighttime sky was a place of honor. And so this story is well over 2,000 years old. And so we find it in our sky. So we have the Lady Andromeda. Whoops, let me use the other pointer. We have the Lady Andromeda right here. We have our hero, Perseus. We have the queen, Cassiopeia. She looks like a W in the nighttime sky. We have her hus husband, King Cepheus, who looks like a house. Then we have our water monster right here, which is Cetus. And then we have our, our winged horse, which is Pegasus. And so these are our major players of this story, and they're all right here. This is more prominent in our fall skies, so it's now way over here in the west, which means that these stars are going to be leaving our sky over the next month or so. And so they're going to get closer and closer to the western horizon. Now. Uh, Pegasus used to be a very, very large constellation. But as the ancient Greeks started up this story of Andromeda and Perseus, they took the back legs of Pegasus and gave it to the constellation of Andromeda. So here's one of our first instances of a constellation being broken apart to make other constellations. So Andromeda looks like a pair of back legs when you see her in the nighttime sky. And then we have, right here, we have uh, two asterisms. Uh, Cassiopeia is known as the W for her W shape. So we sometimes just refer to the W in the nighttime sky. And then uh, the body of Pegasus right here is known as the great square of Pegasus. So you may have seen in the fall skies what looks like a giant baseball diamond in the sky, and that's the great square. So again, those are two of our constellations. And of course, if you look very carefully down here, we see Jupiter. So we can see Jupiter in our western sky at about 7.30 right now, but it's very, very low on the sky. So if we uh, take a look at Jupiter just for a quick moment, uh, this is our largest planet. So um, much larger than Earth. It's about over 300 times massive than the Earth. It's very well known for its great red spot, which is a giant storm system. And that's been going on for over 400 years. But because Jupiter does not have a solid surface, it's not going to break up anytime soon. And this particular planet has 79 moons around it. And remember, Earth only has one. So in the Andromeda galaxy, though, there is a, or sorry, Andromeda constellation, there is the Andromeda galaxy, which is known as Messier 31. And so you can see it here. When you see big red ovals, those are galaxy symbols. And so this particular galaxy has been observed for a very long period of time. It has actually shown up on very old sky maps as gray extended clouds because the sky was much darker back then. They could see much better at night. And so you can actually see this in a really good dark sky area. Unfortunately, where we, ha where we live, we have a lot of light pollution. So you're not going to be able to pick out Andromeda with just your eyes any longer but used to be able to. And so this is known as Messier uh, 31. And then this little guy right here is Messier 110. So that's a little tiny dwarf galaxy that is very close to the Andromeda galaxy. Now, this is actually one of our closest galaxies. It's only two and a half million light years away. <laughs> that's close. <laughs> and that's probably as close as we want it. We don't want it to get too much closer to us because then we might start interacting. And so we want it to be further away from us. But this one is 
<clears throat> very nice because there's the head of Andromeda, and so there's sort of a, a line of stars this way, and you can get to it if you star hop from beta to mu to nu, and there's M31. So there's some neat ways of moving around in the star field once you get more familiar with your constellations. Now, I mentioned before that there are some stars that are binary star systems, but there are some times where you're looking through your telescope or a pair of binoculars and a single star splits into two, but they might not be associated with each other. They might be what we call a double star, where one star just happens to be really close to another star in the field, but they could be like super far apart from each other. And that's what's happening here. So this is Cassiopeia, this is the W, and there's a star here called Eta, and that is a binary star system. It takes a long time for these two stars to orbit each other. It's something over 300 years. But it's a nice system that you can easily find in a binocular or telescope. And then if you look at the foot of Orion, not Orion, uh, Andromeda, this is Almach, this star here is a double star system. So you'll find this star splits into two, but these two stars are really, really far apart. They're not associated with each other. But you just resolve them in a telescope or a pair of binoculars. So a single star to our eye, but two stars when you use a binocular or a telescope to see them. And then you can see that we do have some very small constellations. So believe it or not, there's a constellation out there called Triangulum, the triangle. It's one of the 88. So Pegasus is one of my favorite ones, uh, just because of this giant horse that we have in the nighttime sky. And he's very easy to see with that great square body. But the story about this one is very old. He's a very old constellation. And he was given wings sort of after they developed the story of Perseus and Andromeda. But so there are ancient coins that actually show the picture of Pegasus without wings. And then they, later on, you see coins of Pegasus with wings. But I love this story about Pegasus. This is sometime after the story of Andromeda and Perseus, where uh, a man by the name of Bellerophon was trying to get to heaven, where the gods are. And Zeus didn't like that. So Zeus sent an insect to sting Pegasus and caused Bellerophon to fall off and fall back down to earth. So when we look at the nose of Pegasus, which is this star called Epsilon, it's known as Enif, it rhymes with sniff, we find a little tiny deep sky object. Now, there is no way that they knew that that object was there. Today, it's known as Messier number 15, and we like to refer to this as the fly. This is the, the insect that bit to Bellerophon. And so this here is it's another cluster of stars. But does it look like the other clusters we were seeing earlier? It looks different, right? Can you see space between the stars? Barely. Yeah, barely. It's very, very dense. It's very, very compact. So this type of cluster has a different name. It's called a globular cluster. So this is what a globular cluster is. And so on most star atlases or star maps that you see, you'll see a circle with a cross through it sometimes on your maps. And those are the globular cluster symbols. And so that is what uh, M15 is. And so these can contain upwards of 25,000 stars. These are huge. So these are little tiny gravitationally bound systems. I like to call them little tiny galaxies. So we have dwarf galaxies, and then we have the little miniature galaxies. This is just a little tiny cluster out there. It's pretty far away. But these are inside our galaxy. We haven't left our galaxy yet with these clusters. All right. Now, of course, another uh, important area to look is to the north, because the north is a very special region. Over here, we pick out our dippers. So we have our big dipper and our little dipper in the sky. And then in between them is the dragon. And there's Draco. Draco is really hard to pick out in the nighttime sky. You can usually pick out Draco's head, which they call the lozenge. But the rest of his body can be very difficult to find, because the stars are not very bright. But you'll notice that if you were to turn and face north tonight, the Big Dipper is going to be standing on its handle. So you'll see the Big Dipper kind of coming up, and the cup will be higher up in the sky. 
And then you use these two stars right here, and you can point to the North Star. So they are known as the pointing stars, and they are Dube and Mirac. And so those two stars will help us find the North Star. So when we look at uh, pull, uh, this Ursa Minor, our little dipper, uh, the important star is this star here called Polaris. And you'll notice that there are all these black lines that are running through this atlas. It's just like using a road atlas. We have latitude and longitude lines. Well, we have those same latitude and longitude lines in the nighttime sky, only they have different names. They're called right ascension and declination. But all those right ascension lines, which are like longitudes, they all come to a point, which is called the North Celestial Pole. Just like all the lines of longitude converge to our North Pole on Earth when we ever look at a map of our Earth. And so that's where the rotation axis of Earth is pointing in the sky. And Polaris is the star that is very, very close to it. So we commonly refer to Polaris as the North Star, the star you see when you look to the north. And it always stays right there. Its orbit is so tiny that as the Earth rotates on its axis, it makes a little, little tiny circle. But that circle is so small, you can't see it happening with your eyes. It looks like Polaris stays in the same spot but it is actually moving just a little tiny bit. And now if you like to read old works uh, like Homer's The Odyssey, if you've ever read that book or read that long poem, Homer's The Odyssey never refers to Polaris for giving directions in this, of how to travel around in the sky. And that's because the North Star is not always the North Star. So back at the time when Homer wrote The Odyssey, this was not this point here was not anywhere close to Polaris. It was off over to the side. And so Polaris was not called the North Star at the time Homer wrote the Odyssey. It didn't become the North Star until around the early part of the 1800s, later part of the 1700s, when it started moving close enough to that spot. And so this is what is known as precession. Now for Ursa Major, we have our seven bright stars that make up our Big Dipper. And so that is always a fun one to find. But there are some beautiful galaxies that look really well through binoculars in this particular area of the sky. Uh, two of them are up here. Oops, let me use this pointer because this one's brighter. Two of them are up here, and one of them is over here. So up off of the head of our big bear, he's coming out this way, we find M81 and M82. And these are two beautiful galaxies. We have a grand design spiral galaxy, and we have what is known as a regular galaxy. This one over here has a nickname. It's called the Cigar Galaxy, because it looks like an exploding cigar. <laughs> so these two are, are pretty far away. They're over 11 million light years away. So it's very cool in the nighttime sky. And then uh, we have Messier 51, which is another grand design spiral galaxy. Uh, this one's just off the tail of the Big Bear. But this is actually two galaxies and they're interacting. And this is why we don't want Andromeda close to us because this poor little tiny one over there is being sucked into the big guy. And so he's eating it. So that's what can happen. Galaxies can interact if they get really close together. All right. So I've talked a lot about the January sky, what you can see when you look around, but there are some events coming up that I want you to keep an eye out for. Uh, we have two lunar eclipses that are coming up, one on May 15th and one on November 8th. And so uh, the moon is going to pass through Earth's shadow, and this is going to cause the moon to take on that reddish-orange color. And so there is a list in the back um, that gives you uh, lunar eclipses and solar eclipses, and it gives you the timing. So um, this one starts a little bit after 9 o'clock at night for the May 15th one, and maximum is around midnight. And the other one, though, is an early morning one. It starts at 3 in the morning and ends around 6.51. So if you're a very early morning person, November 8th might not be so bad. <laughs> but if you're a night person, May 15th is, is pretty cool. So that we got that coming up. Um, and then we do have some solar eclipses coming up, but we're not going to see a total solar eclipse here in South Carolina for quite some time. So we have one coming up on October 14th, 2023, 
and then we have one coming up on April 8th, 2024, and both of those are going to be partial eclipses, where we're going to have the moon covering part of the sun in our daytime sky, but not completely covering it. And so um, I believe the one on April 8th will be a much larger coverage than the one on October 14th. That's going to be a, a less partial coverage, under 50%. Um, and if you want to see a solar eclipse, a total solar here in South Carolina, uh, May 11th, 2078, <laughs> 56 more years to go. Mark yep, mark that calendar. So uh, yeah, it's, it, I, I, I will be over 100. So um, you might have to do some traveling to the other one. So if you want to see the April 8th one, which is going to cost through our country, uh, you might want to head to Texas in that area, that'll be where the path of totality will be crossing through. And then uh, we do have meteor showers. Meteor showers are when Earth passes through debris fields. And so um, they occur all the time throughout the year. Uh, we just actually came out of a debris field, so we won't really see a lot of meteor streaks for a while. But um, they'll come from a particular area of the sky, usually associated with one of the constellations. That's where the radiant point is from. And so you look for that at certain times of the year. So there is also a list in the back, which is the meteor showers. So you can just keep this, cal this calendar forever because it always repeats around that same time period. And so a few days before, a few days after, is when you can see those meteor streaks in the sky if you look for that constellation. And so finding an atlas, they'll help you tell you where that constellation is going to be. All right, and so I think that takes me to the end. You can mention the Aurora Borealis. Oh, yes, the Aurora Borealis, yes. Um, unfortunately for where we live in South Carolina, uh, we don't get to see the Aurora Borealis. Sometimes up in North Carolina, in the Blue Ridge Mountain Parkway area, you can see the Aurora Borealis if it was a huge solar superstorm. But this is something where if you can get yourself to Canada or to Alaska to see the Aurora Borealis, that's the best place to go. But, but they're really cool. <laughs> and if you just want to do solar observing, you can use a very special filter on your telescope and you can see sunspots on the sun. This is actually the sun yesterday. So there are some big dark spots. And I have some solar viewers if you want to take a pair home. All right, so I'll go back to this. If you want to bring the lights up, go ahead. And if anyone has any questions, I'll be happy to. I have a question concerning yes. the, the star. You say they're binary stars. Yes. What keeps them attracted to each other, and will they eventually? Um, for most stars that are gravitationally bound together, it's just their mutual gravities. So somehow, as they were forming, they just swung around each other, and they formed these very stable orbits going around each other. So they'll stay like that for quite some time until one of the stars starts to change. And you could have one star dump mass onto another star, or if one star explodes, that could affect the other star as well. So for the most part, they'll stay nicely gravitationally bound for quite some time. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. You say a meteor shower, uh -huh. and you use a constellation. You use that constellation to locate? That yep, so that's where all the streaks are going to be seeming to come from. But they don't really no, no, it, it's just our appearance because of where the star field is. So, for instance, on April 26th, we have the Lyrid meteor shower. So we look for the constellation of Lyra, and that's where the streaks will seem to be coming from. And that's why it's named Lyrid, mm -hmm. or the constellation. Yeah, yeah. And so those are little tiny rocks, usually about the size of a pea, that are burning up in our atmosphere. It's little dust grains. And E equals mc squared, a little bit of mass has a lot of energy. We see that long streak come from those fireballs. It's a cool event. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. The photograph of the sun you had mm -hmm. previously. Yeah. This is a simple question from my simple mind. Okay. And I probably need to ask it in your children's program. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> but, you know, throughout the year, right now the sun is rising over here. Yes. Now, July 18th or whatever. Yep, it'll be, be more north. Yep. Mm -hmm. place on the opposite side. And I understand the tilt of the earth and the different seasons. Yes. But what's, what, what are the mechanics of the sun over here and over there? I know the sun's not moving. I know I understand we're moving, but please explain that sure. elementary yep. where I can understand it. Yep. 
Okay. So here's our Earth, and we'll give our Earth its tilt, which is around 23 and a half degrees. So um, let's pretend our flower pot here is the sun. Okay. So as Earth goes around the sun, it has its tilt, but it doesn't go like this. It stays like this. And so as we walk around the sun, we change how the sun is shining on us. So when we're this way, where we're kind of in line here, the sun is shining directly on the sides. And this is what is known as the equinox. So this is where we have spring and fall. When we were over here, our north pole was pointing more towards the sun. So that's summertime. And then people who live in Australia are in wintertime. So when we come all the way around, and now we end up over on this side, now the South Pole is pointing more towards the sun, so they get the summertime. We're pointing away from the sun, we get wintertime. And then it continues around, and we get our spring and our fall, and then we go back around again. So, yeah, so it's sort of this, this motion. And so when they have an equinox right here, that is when the sun rises in the east and sets directly in the west. So it's always very close to east or west in the sky. When we're in summertime, over here, we're getting more in the north, so the sun seems to be appearing more in the northern part of the sky. It has a very, very long path through the sky and then goes down in the northwest. When we're in the winter months, the sun is more to the south. So it rises more in the southeast, but it has a very short path through the sky and sets in the southwest. And so our winter months are very short. So right now we're in the winter months. So we have very short days, but our days are getting longer and longer because we're getting closer and closer to that equinox date of March, around March 21st, March 22nd. And so that, that's just that repeating yearly pattern. And so we used to track the position of the sun on the sky, and that was what was called an observable calendar. And that's how we figured out the year is about 365 days. So they used to put stone pillars or wood blocks, and they would mark the passage going from north to south of that sun. Does that answer your question? Somewhat. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I understand the tilt, the equinox, the solstice, all mm -hmm. of that, but I still can't understand the mechanics. The yeah, it, it's just it's a slow change because Earth is slowly changing and we're walking around, and remember, it takes us 12 months to go all the way around. So it's a very slow drift of that sun along the horizon to go from that north side to that south side. And so it's about six months to go in between. So, so in other words, the Earth is not doing that? No, the Earth stays like this, okay. and then and just spins and spins it's and spins. It's actually the same, mm -hmm. where, where it goes definitely not before. Yep, so the things that affect the... The season is the tilt, the where we're getting, the, so how much time you get from the sun. So it's the height of the sun in the sky, and it's the length of time that you get sunlight from that really affects our seasons. So a higher height means longer exposure time, which means hotter temperatures, so that's summer. All right, now what about, what about the moon? Because I've noticed that the moon seems to have, you know, sometimes if I look out a certain window, the moon is going to be over here. Yep. I thought I read that there were either 17 or 19 or some number of possible... Yeah. So the moon, as it goes around the Earth, the moon's orbit is not perfectly aligned to our equator projection onto the sky. It has its own little angle tilt of 5 degrees. And that's why it shifts. And so it's got almost a 10 degree shift around that um, equator point, the due east and due west. And so um, it's not always at the same height. So if you think of it as a tabletop, if this is our equator of our Earth, sometimes the moon is above it, sometimes it's below it, and sometimes it's right in line with the equator of the Earth. And so it can appear a little bit more to the north side of east when it comes up, or it can appear more to the south side of east when it comes up. So it has that, that little range of space. And then it, as it goes around the Earth, it's a weird pattern. That's where you get the 17 days, the 19 days that you see between it. But it's about 30 days to go through one set of phases. And so it just shifts a little okay, bit. So in other words, that is related to its tilt. 
Yes. Yeah, its own little five degree tilt. Yeah. And that's why we don't have eclipses every single month, too, where it has to have that perfect alignment between the Earth, the Sun, and the Moon, where shadows are all aligned, that we can then have an eclipse appear. So sometimes if the Moon is higher near its five degree tilt part, then the shadow is going over the top of Earth, so we don't get an eclipse. Yeah. <laughs> that's not me. <laughs> yeah, no, it's the... Yeah, it's the, the AC unit or heater unit kicked in. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, I'm amazed at your knowledge and what you can do to just readily stay comfortable. <laughs> I, I, I see what you've been doing all these years. Oh, yes. But um, I, I've always uh, found this, and uh, uh, even as a child, I, I have found the Big Dipper. I'm very excited when I can mm -hmm. find the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper. Yep. However, I live in the city of Georgetown. I have always lived in a city. So where can I go, practically speaking, to get the least amount of light pollution? To look at me, to look for these things. Yeah, so it's a little bit harder along the coastline area here because you can go a little bit further north, kind of to the, there's the Myrtle Beach State Park area. And so, but they're just south of the city of Myrtle Beach, so that you get a lot of light pollution to your north. But we didn't, I, my friends and I, we went camping at the Myrtle Beach State Park, and we were able to see some of the stars. You can also go inland a little bit. Um, Huntington, Huntington Beach, yes, that, that's Huntington another good Beach state park. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so usually the state parks are usually pretty good because they have open field areas, mm -hmm. and so then they're usually away from the city lights. But you're going to have probably some glow depending upon how close the nearest big city is to you. So, unfortunately. Well, a nice guy observing for anybody that has telescopes. Hampton Park is working on becoming a you know, place for observers. Nice. And it's good and dark there. About the only closest light you can see is in the steam generator, nice people. <laughs> but still, it don't. It's still real dark. Yeah. Hampton State uh, Historic Hampton Site. State yeah. Yeah. Good. That's a good site there. Right. You can go out here to Morgan Park also on the water side and look towards the east and it's fairly dark. That's that way also. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of it's just trying to find, getting away from the big cities. If you know somebody with a big field or a big barn, those are usually good places too. Yes, so uh, we right now have an audio failure that's occurred. It, our audio system, our audio mixer died on November 1st. <laughs> but we sent it off to Oregon to be repaired, and it is on its way back across the country. <laughs> so as soon as UPS delivers it, <laughs> we're going to put it back in, and we're going to hopefully everything's going to work correctly and that there's not something else wrong that we haven't known about. But right now, we're not doing our usual public shows because we're, I'm limited to only 32 guests in the room at once. And because some people have to drive a very long time, it's not, a, not fair to say, sorry, you can't come in because I have no seats. So as soon as we get our room cap released, we'll open up to public shows again. But right now, we're just doing private group requests. And that's online? That they can check with Francis Marion University? Google yep. Me. Yep, at astro.fmarion.edu. So. All right. Jeanette, thank you very, yeah. very much. Thank you. Excellent. Oh, yeah, I know. I know we went over. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, it's wonderful. What a great, uh, you're, you're right, Linda, what an incredible knowledge and uh, experience and the handouts back there uh, to take a look at. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, just to let you know about a few things coming up for the future, uh, our next uh, Tuesdays with is on Tuesday, February 15th. It's always the third Tuesday. So you can figure it out. We got a Tuesday starting February 15th, and we're going to be having Leona Joy Bonds speaking on the subject of um, the subject of uh, life and times of James Bowley. James Bowley was the grand nephew of Harriet Tubman, and after the Civil War, during the Reconstruction period, lived here in Georgetown. He originally was from Maryland. He was in the first group of slaves that Harriet Tubman rescued on the Underground Railroad, for whatever reason, and that's part of what you'll hear in the presentation, he ends up here in Georgetown after the Civil War during Reconstruction, 
becomes a superintendent, I'm going to ruin the whole talk, uh, becomes superintendent of schools here in Georgetown County, becomes a member of the board of the University of South Carolina, an incredible life, uh, and he had his home here in Georgetown, and it's been recently fixed up, um, and so it's just a very, very important part of our history. We often hear about Joseph Hain Rainey, but this is also another very significant figure who's a part of our history here in Georgetown. And Leona Joy Bonds, who's a local historian and uh, school teacher, school administrator. Her husband uh, is Dedrick Bonds, who spoke last year on Joseph Hain Rainey. And the two of them are a wonderful one-two about uh, important historic figures here in Georgetown. February 15th, 10 o'clock on that day. Uh, on the 18th of February, a special presentation talking about children's programs to which you are all cordially invited, commemorating black history with the Bright Star Theater are going to do a production on George Washington Carver here for children, but adults are cordially invited, encouraged to be here. That's going to be on Friday, February 18th, um, and that'll be at 4.30 here in the auditorium. Um, let me just say, as you're you know, hearing these dates and an awful lot of information, uh, we have a Friends of the Library, Friends of Georgetown Library email list, and I just send out information to keep people informed of upcoming events. I promise not to inundate you with things. I just send out an announcement, usually a one reminder later on. But if, you like, if you're not on that list and you would like to be on that list, there's membership forms back there. You don't necessarily need to join, but if you put your name and email address I'll put you on that list so you're updated on events that are happening. Another date coming up is the, we got a great date coming up this year, 2-22-22, Tuesday, Tuesday 2-22-22. You like all the 2-2-2. Um, on that date, which is the week after our next uh, Tuesday's WID lecture, is our annual meeting of the Friends. It's a business meeting, stick with me, don't go asleep yet. It's a business meeting which will be having an important review of our bylaws, election of officers, which we have delayed by one year because of COVID, as well as our business reports and so forth. But also at that meeting, we also do something to get you to come out to that meeting, since who wants to go to a business meeting? We always have a special presentation. This year, I think it's something really special. A brand new book has just come out literally this month entitled Flowering Plants of Hobcall Barony. It just was printed. Uh, I got a copy from a good friend who's one of the two authors. But Maureen Mulligan, who is a botanist out at uh, Hobcall under the Clemson program, is going to be here to talk about this book and do a beautiful presentation on the flowers, wildflowers, that are out at Hobcall and obviously then all through this area. So that's going to be a part of the meeting. It goes from 4.30 to 6 on February 22nd. Uh, we do about a half hour, 45 minute business and a 45 minute presentation by Maureen. And this book will be available for purchase. It'll be the first time it'll be available for purchase here with the friends of the library. So we're excited about that. All right, so the 15th, the 18th, and the 22nd, you got all those dates. And one more, uh, we're doing something special this year. Um, in the fall, we had a community, we always have had a community yard sale. It's a small fundraiser for the library, but a wonderful community event. We take the parking lot back here in the, what's the courthouse parking lot behind the library, and you can, per, you can rent uh, a parking spot or two parking spots and get a community yard sale. You don't have to do the advertising, we'll do it. Everybody comes, it was a huge crowd here in the, in the fall. Unfortunately, about an hour and a half into it, the rains came tumbling down. Um, but it was a great time and a lot of people were here. We're gonna have that again on March 19th. So either come to buy or if you wanna get rid of stuff you've been you know, getting, wanting to get rid of and we'll take care of the advertising and all those kinds of things. It's only $15 for a parking spot or $20 for two and to come in that morning from 8 to noon on March 19th. And there's actually, I think, back there still uh, some posters if they're available, when they're available. Or, again, we'll email everybody and let you know about that. It's a lot of events coming up. But this was wonderful. And I want to thank again Jeanette so much. Thank you. And I'm sure she'll be available. If you have some questions, let her know. And uh, thanks so much for being here today. God bless. Stay safe in 2022.